Hi, welcome to another installment of the Proven Sales Letter Breakdown Series that I'm doing for 90 days, breaking down all sorts of proven sales letters throughout history written by the greats of copywriting. And today we're going to look at a pretty famous ad from the legendary David Ogilvy. And this was one of his most uh, successful ads ever. And it's a Rolls Royce ad. So yes, the car Rolls Royce. And uh, the cool thing about this is that it was written in 19... 58 so quite a while ago uh, but this ad apparently doubled the sales of Rolls Royce models in a pretty short amount of time and then everybody was trying to copy it to some degree but the main point I want to make with this breakdown isn't necessarily copy in the ad itself because if you read through it and I and I recommend you uh, hand copy it because it's not so long at all but it's basically just a list of well kind of features that the car has so a list of various features and benefits so it's very logical copywriting in this sense which is usually not a good thing to do because you want to appeal to emotions you want your copy to be uh, very effective in in emotional storytelling and like uh, punch in the gut type of storytelling and you want to evoke those strong core emotions that move people that motivate them to do something and only then when you have that should you basically try to convince them with logical arguments that they should buy something from you now this ad is a little bit different and the key point I want to make here is the big idea the concept of the big idea which is very important in copywriting and according to many many uh, like real titans of, of, of copywriting the big idea can single-handedly sell your uh, product with a promotion regardless of how good the rest of the copy it is if your big idea is good if it draws people in if it really connects with what they want or what they feel in a sense uh, then it will be effective so a great example of a good big idea for example is the end of america promotion so this was written by mike palmer like 10 years ago or something and uh, it just basically the big idea was that uh, you know, if the dollar gets uh, devalued too too much, or if the um, if the United States, you know, is so indebted that basically it won't be able to repay its interest rates on, on on the loans on the bonds that you know it owes to people who buy bonds in the United States government, then you know everything will fall apart and life as we know it in the United States. Uh, will fall apart and this this was the so-called end of America big idea also there are several others and financial copywriters are really really good in this uh, but this I think that the big idea is what carries this ad really and this is a gamer term carry it means that it's the thing that you know uh, has the most impact in whether it's successful or not and the big idea here is that uh, basically uh, you know you'll have a tranquil and peaceful life in this car. So David Ogilvy did a lot of research. He was very big on researching the audience and he discovered that, you know, what the, the target audience for this, so basically rich people who wanna buy true luxury cars want is a peaceful life, a life in which we don't have to worry about like the car, like falling together fa falling apart on them they don't have to worry about noise they can enjoy comforts in life you know comforts that other people can't really enjoy and you have to keep in mind that in those times you know we're talking 1958 cars were terrible compared to today's cars they were lo loud they constantly break broke down they had they they, they didn't have these precise machine uh, engineered parts and everything so everything was much more raw and David Ogilvy knew this and he knew that the target audience what they would really like desire from a car at that time was peace was a sense of like I don't have to worry about it a sense of silence sense of like that was true luxury that he identified that this was true luxury so that's why the headline itself became at 60 miles an hour the loudest noise in this new Rolls Royce comes from the electric clock and on the surface you know it doesn't seem like a big deal and to the to uh, someone who's not in the target audience it's not so why should I care about this but uh, the, the, the reason why this works so well is because he knew that 
if the target audience read this, they're gonna feel and think like, oh my God, this car must be so meticulously engineered. So, so it's a masterpiece. It's almost like a piece of art or something. Not a, like very few people can have something like this. And it's a masterpiece because it's, it's so well put together that the uh, loudest noise that you can hear at 60 miles an hour, which is like a psychological limit, uh, comes from the electric clock. And I can imagine that an electric clock was kind of progressive in itself in 1958. But like the main part here is that the target audience, after reading this, they're going to feel and think like, wow, this must be really quiet. So this must mean that everything is, is so well engineered, so well put together. Nothing rattles, you know, it doesn't give away a cheap vibe. And I can feel like true royalty in it. And I can have tranquil moments with, with my family. And it's no wonder why we have this type of image. We have uh, uh, someone here, which appears to be a woman or like a longer haired guy. I don't know, but two children are coming in. So this was actually advertised as a family car in which that you drive. Okay. Because usually especially in those, those times, what happened is that most super luxury cars uh, were driven by chauffeurs and then the owner was sitting in the back. But this was specifically a type of luxury car that people could also enjoy uh, driving. So that was quite the appeal because uh, probably he noticed that you know, people wanted to also drive their cars now, if they were good cars actually. And then with this, the company gave people what they wanted. And the story with this big idea, just very quickly, is that uh, David Ogilvy read uh, like research for three weeks what to write. Like, think about it. This is just like only like, I don't know, 500 words of copy or even less, like 400. And he took three weeks total of research. And then finally, he found a an article, a technical article, uh, from a journal in which something like this was mentioned and like an obscure little detail if you think about it but this is what he chose as a headline because he knew that uh, cars back then were super loud and then uh, rich people the target audience there wanted something uh, more posh okay so that was the big idea and then the hook that hooked people in emotionally to the big idea of having this tranquil life having this uh, silent quiet car was that um, you know at 60 miles an hour the loudest noise uh, is the electric clock and then we have a subhead as well by saying you know what makes Rolls Royce the best car in the world and immediately like this is a philosophical question if you've been following my videos you know that I like to ask these philosophical questions as well because they start they, they make uh, readers think a little bit more uh, and it makes sense so uh, even though it's an incredible claim, you know, best car in the world, it draws people in, especially the target audience, uh, who are used to the finest things in life, okay? And then they want to find out what it is, like what's the reason why we have a claim like this. But it also, I think it pre-validates the target audience's already existing beliefs a little bit. Because like, uh, I always knew that, you know, Royce Royce was the best car in the world, and now I'm going to find out why. So it kind of, it creates a little bit of curiosity as well. But then, very interestingly, what comes after the question is, uh, there is really no magic about it. It is merely patient attention to details, says an eminent Royce Royce engineer. So basically, what this means essentially is that we meticulously craft the best, uh, we don't just promise. And it's not magic at all, you know, uh, this is pure engineering it's like like german type of engineering uh it's very meticulous attention to detail and it's no magic about it and i think that rich people love this idea because they want to have stuff they they value these types of stuff it's kind of like almost like an artwork okay and uh it also lends credibility to the, to the whole thing because if you were to say you know this car is magic some people would feel like bullshit like come on why should it be magic but like then after this, he can get away by just having the entire ad be a bunch of logical reasons why this is this is good. So this is reason why copy. Uh, it's not emotional, like not specifically emotional, and it doesn't focus on the problems as much. Uh, and back in those days, I think this was more fashionable to use these benefit type of of promotions. Um, 
but then we have a little bit of, of rehash of the headline in the first point, which serves as proof once again. And then, you know, it also introduces the unique uh, selling proposition or the unique mechanism of why this is so special. It's because, you know, um, like three mufflers tune out sound frequencies acoustically. So that's why it's so quiet. And then the second point uh, is even more attention to detail, like how the engine runs and how, you know, the technology on how it's actually so quiet. Then the third point is, um, makes the point that I just made that, you know, up until that point, people uh, have been driven by chauffeurs in these types of cars, but now, you know, it's actually shorter, it's easily maneuverable, and you can drive it, you can experience the joy of driving yourself, and it also gives you control, and you can do with it whatever you want. Um, then even more, you know, features that, today they sound comical, like it has power steering, so what, but back then, it was something really special. And it's like it has also power brakes and automatic gear shift so no chauffeur required very easy to drive and to park so he knew probably that one of the big pain points of of uh, people especially women probably was parking especially bigger cars so this just communicates easy convenient less trouble and if you're rich like what do you want do you want more trouble in life heck no you want to buy back your time you want to buy back your worry you don't want to worry about anything you want everything taken care of that's what you want if you're rich and this car brings you close, closer to that dream then in point five again we have the unique selling proposition another one is that you know the whole car like uh, is subjected to 98 different type of types of ordeals so it's basically uh it's very meticulously tested as well so that each and every um you know uh, example of this car that goes out you can be sure that you know it's the real deal and it's and it's super high quality and you won't have to like struggle with it or something even less hassle and then the seven point um, kind of I think it symbolizes timelessness so like it's it just says like a random fun fact that hey this radiator in the beginning in the front of the car hasn't changed since like forever and what this means actually is that it's timeless so if you buy it and you want to sell it like 10 years later or something uh, it's still gonna be timeless in this sense and you know what if somebody were to, dr to drive such a car right now in 2021 I mean it would still turn heads it's like not just because it's old but it's like wow they would recognize it that it's a Royce Royce it's it's yeah then the eighth point is once again a tic uh, meticulous attention to detail uh, like regarding the paint job, even more comfort in the eighth one, ninth one actually. So it's all about attention to detail, comfort, attention to detail, comfort. So that's that's the whole big idea. And you see how, you know, the big idea is that, uh, you know, you'll have a tranquil and peaceful life in this. It's kind of like the, the vision for the whole uh, product and the whole advertisement itself and then everything that comes after that is there to supplement this vision to basically underline it and support it the headline the hook the all the the reasons why this is such a good car uh, then the 11 point is a little bit weird it's a bunch of like you can fit a bunch of extract like well, like what the fuck extras like you can put in an espresso coffee making machine in it a dictating machine even cold water for washing, even hot water, an electric razor. So um, I think the, po the point of this was that you can customize it to your liking. And if you're like a busy executive or something, uh, then you can still like do some chores in this as well. I I'm not sure about this. Like today, I, w I don't really think that today's super luxury cars really would advertise something like this like who wants to like shave in their supercar but like hey i don't know maybe in that time it was something that people wanted then the 12th point is about safety comfort and prestige so it also introduces safety so that you know you have three different types of brakes and probably because you know back in those times i think uh accidents happened way uh way more often because of like brake failures or something okay so stuff that we don't have to worry about today because all our cars are super modern and they're based on like 100 years of engineering but uh in those days you know not everything was so super uh polished like nowadays you can get even in a, in a super entry level car uh, so yeah
it's uh, also a good idea to bring this in because again what do rich people want they want comfort and and not having to worry about something but they also want safety they want to preserve like they built up this lifestyle they want to preserve their um their their health their safety so that they can enjoy the lifestyle even longer so then we have at 13 i'm not exactly sure about this he says that the bentley is made by royce royce so I'm guessing, you know, Bentley was kind of like a, a competition model in the sense that uh, it's still made by, by the same parent company, but it's like still a friendly competition between various um, models. And then this is like, hey, you know, regardless of what you buy, you will um, you will get something similar, but, but you will still uh, feel uh, different. You will feel diffident, interesting, uh, about driving a Rolls Royce, and then you can buy a Bentley. So I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, about this 13 point here. Maybe you can leave a comment below if you if you know the meaning, like why he actually used a, a very very valuable piece of real estate before the price. Uh, speaking this, but either it was to like get more sales for uh, Bentley as well, because you know if this created desire for Rolls Royce, and then Bentley is made by the same company apparently, then you know it can it can also get uh, funnel customers there as well but if it was just a subtle jab at it that you know you want Royce Royce even more then uh, then it might have been an interesting choice so then we have a straight up direct offer to the price no copywriting words missing or something no like hey special offer or something because I think it's it's not needed at all like the target audience has a bunch of money and they don't even want to see deals they want to see like a straight up price and in fact probably the the more expensive it is the more they can brag about it so um yeah it's just like hey this this is it like take it or leave it that's it uh and then we we don't even have like a strong call to action as well because again i, I don't think it's needed for this specific audience um, this target audience, so rich people, executives, uh, company owners, I don't know, maybe very high paid doctors, uh, they, or lawyers, uh, they don't like to be bossed around. They don't like to be instructed. So like, why should, you know, you try to use, again, it's all about context as well. And I think David Ogilvy knew this because using the same old like, uh, formulas to like, uh, anchor the price to something higher and then and then highlight how good of a deal this is it just wouldn't work for the luxury market that much and uh, he knew this and that's why it's, there's no aggressive call to action as well is that if you want it then just call you know uh, a dealer because you know it's not gonna like nobody's gonna sell a car like this just with a like call to action button or like something like that uh, obviously there's going to be like a very high quality visit to the dealer with a very prestigious and high quality uh, like experience that they can trust test drive the car and you know the salesperson is going to do the rest so uh, this doesn't try to close people i think that's the important thing here and that's why it's kind of like it's not necessarily a like I mean it is a direct response ad to some degree definitely but it kind of has like it seems to me like a hybrid it also has like a brand marketing elements as well and then the sales people in the in the dealership will do the closing itself but at that point like I would really have I would really love to be the salesperson at that specific Rolls Royce dealership because they would have such a like easy time because think about it any lead that gets to them it's a super qualified warm lead after something like this and uh, basically they're pre-sold so the salesman just have to like uh, reignite the the fire inside them just remind them of these uh, reasons just just demonstrate the whole experience in real life as well because this paints a picture in the target audience's mind but the uh, the salesperson will also be able to to uh, dimensionalize it when as a demo so it's just like a demo when when people you know who are interested in this car they will actually sit inside the car and they will notice everything they will notice the silence and then they're gonna feel like yes this is what I want and uh, yeah I think that's why it was an effective ad not necessarily because it, it directly sold something but it's it, it still created that momentum that probably took the credit for most of the sale okay so so yeah that's it with this one as you can see not every piece of copy 
effective piece of copy at least has to be long at all we've looked at longer and shorter ones so far this one's really interesting because it's not about flashy it's not like Gary Halbert's type of copywriting but it is what it is and it was super powerful and it was one of David Ogilvy's best ads ever it's and and he was one of the best uh, m like copywriters ever so you better believe that this this really delivered so yeah hope you enjoyed this uh, hope uh, you learned a ton from it if you did then I'd appreciate it if you liked the video also left a comment with your number one takeaway like what was the the main idea that you came away from this video and also uh, if you enjoyed it like feel free to share with others as well so that others can also join in in my challenge and uh, and uh, follow around these videos. So thank you so much again. See you in the next one.